I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a podcast about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Now this week, we've got a story about broken promises and a financial disaster looming that might make the 2008 crisis look like nothing. We're talking trillions and trillions of dollars on the line and the future of many, many Americans and people all around the world. Yes, that's right. We're going to talk about pensions today. Now, that might sound boring and maybe not as dramatic as a problem of the other things we cover on this show. But believe me when I tell you that this is one of the major catastrophes looming in the not too distant future. And in some places, it's the present right now. That's right. This is a reality that's being felt around the world as retirees are finding out that the money they were promised for companies that they worked decades, their whole lives for, isn't materializing, and the outlook for their retirement is very bleak. And this is really a global ticking time bomb. The world's six largest pension saving systems, the US, UK, Japan, Netherlands, Canada, and Australia, are expected to reach a $224 trillion gap by 2050. This is the amount of money that they would need to come up with at this time to keep these pension systems alive. And globally, we're looking at a savings gap of $400 trillion by 2050. This is five times the global GDP. And while these numbers are huge, and this disaster is looming an unavoidable, enormous problem, it's not actually something new. We tend to think of our financial inventions, things like pensions, things like the market, as a relatively recent creation, and the problems that we face with them having never existed before. But in reality, pensions, the idea of retiring, of somebody being able to pay you in this section of your life, is old. And the problems that go along with this also go way, way back. Yeah, this concept of having a retirement at the end of your life, being set up so that you don't have to work anymore and you can just enjoy life in your final years, is a centuries-old idea. In fact, some have even argued that some famous military mutinies in the Roman Empire were caused by changes to the retirement age and pension benefits of Roman legionnaires. But In the United States, the first ever pension was introduced in New York City. This was in 1857, and it was a way to pay benefits for injured police officers. American Express was the first private company and the next pension in line, and they adopted one in 1875. And these pensions evolved from there slowly, adding more benefits and becoming more widespread. But it was really in the post-war era that pensions as we know them today really began to take off and flourish. And so our modern notion of pensions, at least in the United States, and it followed in much of the world as well, sort of came to light in the 1950s in this post-World War II boom when the economy was growing at a massive rate, when all these soldiers were coming home and looking for work, and a lot of power was in the workers' hands. There were strong unions, businesses were growing quickly and needed lots of employees, and they needed talented, trained employees, and a lot of these people were after having come out of the military. And so people, this rapidly growing middle class, suddenly had a lot of power in terms of their bargaining potential with employers. And one of the things that that created was pensions. These employees, these unions came together and were able to argue with businesses, with corporations, with their employers, that in exchange for a small sacrifice in terms of their direct salary, they would take this deferred compensation. So I'll give you a little bit of money. You set it aside, invest it for me. And then in the years when I'm retiring from your company, and and again, because this was the 1950s, the 1960s, when you would work at a company for 20 plus years, most of your life, you're a company man, as the word was at the time. This pension was a sort of agreement between the employer and the employee that I will stay with you. And then one day I will pay you back for this after you're no longer working for me as a thank you for this time. And as a return for deferring a little bit of your upfront salary in order to let me pay you years from now, when you need it, when you're no longer working. And this worked really well for a while. It went hand in hand with extremely high interest rates in the markets, as high as 10%, more than that. And so pensions grew and were safe and everybody rejoiced. When you would retire, you would have this check coming in along with your social security and you would live a comfortable life. And many of our grandparents, and I'm a millennial, so I've never known a pension and I never will, but many of our grandparents did or might still do today. But then things began to change. A number of factors have contributed to the decline of these traditional pensions. Less companies have offered them. More people are relying on individual investment accounts and savings for retirement. 
And part of the reason is because it's become more and more apparent that these pension systems are just unsustainable. And maybe they always were, but a number of factors have brought that reality to light. The huge population boom that caused this surplus of workers, well, those workers suddenly started retiring when they got to the end of their lives. And now instead of a few workers, seven maybe, to one retiree, eventually as time went on and more and more people retired and the worker explosion wasn't happening anymore, that became two to one. And now every two workers would have to support one retiree, which is no longer sustainable. In addition, we've had stock market crashes and recessions, which have undermined returns and the ability for pensions to grow these funds in the first place. And life expectancy has gone up. In the 1950s, when we started to see the proliferation of these pension systems, retirement age in the United States was 65 years old. And the average life expectancy was between 65 and 70. So many of these pensions only had to pay out benefits for a couple years on average. But now life expectancies are much higher. So instead of two or three years to pay out pensions, companies are now faced with 20 or 30 years that they might be on the hook to pay these pensioners. And so as you can see, a crisis is looming in this. Lots of private corporations are already getting out of this. But the one place where pensions really have stuck around is in the public sector. And as you can imagine, these problems that we've mentioned are also just as pertinent for these public pension programs. And in fact, we're already starting to see some of them explode, like in Dallas, for example. Dallas is such a good example of the perverse incentives that have become associated with these pensions and the potential for them to cause catastrophe in an otherwise healthy municipality or city. So two years ago in 2016, Dallas was experiencing rapid economic growth, twice the rate of the United States, and it was the fastest growing of the largest cities in the country. But despite this, the mayor came out that year and said that they were on the verge of bankruptcy. And it was all because of a massive shortfall in the pension obligations to their police and firemen. The Dallas Police and Fire Pension System asked the city for a one-time bailout to stay alive. And the amount they needed was $1.1 billion. Okay, first of all, this wasn't even close to the amount they needed to be fully funded. This is just what they needed in the short term. And second of all, this amount would have consumed the city's entire annual general fund. Yeah, this is a great example of a point that we're going to bring up later. That when these pensions implode, really, for lack of a better word, we're forced to bail them out somehow. And usually that bailout comes from the taxpayer, whether that's raised taxes, whether that's budget pulled from things that we need, like schools, like funding, like road work. This money has to come from somewhere. And so these citizens of these municipalities are on the hook bailing out these poorly managed pension funds that made unrealistic promises. But uh, this is all something maybe that we'll get into in a little bit later with more detail. Yeah, that's a good point, David. And that's what this pension system was asking Dallas to do is say, hey, we need a billion dollars. And that's all the money that you have for community services, for salaries, for public workers. But we're going to have to ask you to give that to us instead. And the mayor came out and said, look, if we pay that, we're going to go bankrupt. We can't operate as a city if we do that. And although Dallas, this is an extreme example and an exceptional one when it comes to mismanagement, the underlying incentives and realities that got them into such a bad situation in the first place exists in many pensions across the country and around the world. And remember, so one of the core reasons these public pensions exist in the first place is to attract and maintain quality people, which improves the quality of city services and helps attract more residents. And it's so hard for politicians to avoid the incentive of making an impossible long-term promise in exchange for some short-term benefit that will make the city look better and attract popular attention. You know what this is reminding me of right here, Daniel? What's that? It's our infrastructure episode, right? Once again, short-term promises that promise immediate, short economic growth with no foresight or thought to the future of how we're going to eventually pay for this when it has to come around. And maybe that's something that comes from these short-term elections or just a society that's obsessed with short-term gains, but our lack of understanding of what's in the future seems like it's going to keep getting us in a pickle. Yeah, exactly. And so let me tell you what, what Dallas did in 1993. They added a benefit to the police and firefighter pension system, which offered an individual savings account with indefinite guaranteed 8.5% interest rate. Oh, wait, wait. They they guaranteed 8.5% interest rate indefinitely. On these savings accounts for workers 50 years and older. Wow. Let me get one of those. (laughs) Yeah, it's, I mean, when you say it out loud, it's pretty obvious. This is just silly and impossible, right? 
it could be justified as affordable by assuming, hey, as long as we have an indefinite 5% growth in worker salaries, because this is where the contributions in the pension system will come from, and as long as we get 9% returns on the pension fund investments indefinitely. Oh, the, just those two things? We'll be able to pay for this. Yeah, that's easy. No problem. <laughs> 9% growth for forever plus uh, infinite growth in, in employees. Easy peasy. Right. And it was this need for a 9% return which led fund managers to take extraordinarily risky investments. And the finger always gets pointed at these fund managers. They're the easy ones to blame, right? Oh, mismanagement in the pension system led to these budget shortfalls, and now we're facing these problems. But in a way, the fund manager's hands are tied. They have to provide returns. They have to go seek risky investments because there's so much pressure to get those returns in order to pay these impossible benefits. So... (laughs) This is my favorite part of this Dallas story. So not only were fund managers spending millions of dollars just flying around the world looking at these exotic investments, you know, buying things like farmland in Australia, timberland in South America, uh, fancy resorts in California. But Museum Tower is my favorite investment that these Dallas fund trustees made. What, what, what is Museum Tower, Daniel? For those of us that aren't intimately familiar with the architecture of the world, what is Museum Tower? Museum Tower is this high-rise condominium that was situated in Dallas's Historic Arts Center. And these fund managers, they made a modest $20 million investment into the development of this high-rise. Peanuts, really. Yeah. And it was across from this sculpture museum. And shortly after they made this very modest investment, they said, you know what? This is a nice area. Let's increase our investment. And then that became, you know what? Let's take this building's height and double it. (laughs) And then finally they said, you know what, let's go all in for $200 million. Oh, yeah, of course. A reasonable $200 million investment. Well, you know, as long as it provides return, it it is a good investment, right? Sure. And Museum Tower gets its name from this sculpture museum that was in this historic art center. And it had a glass roof. It was designed to allow natural light into the museum to enhance these exhibits and, you know, give a pleasant experience for visitors. Well, when this museum tower was finally built, it was so tall. Right across the street, right? Right across the street, yeah. And the glass facade acted as a huge reflector for the sun's rays. It concentrated right through the roof of the museum, blinding visitors, damaging sculptures. Some (laughs) artists closed their exhibit saying, my work is destroyed. And the director of the pension fund, you know, there was this big drama in the press and the museum director was like furious. And the fund director basically just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I guess the museum could change its roof. <laughs> I, that's such a great microcosm story of what this whole fund world is like with short-sighted uh, decisions, no regard at all to how these play out for the people around them and even even the people who are dependent upon these pensions, really. As long as the fund managers, as long as companies investing this stuff gets their section of the check, then you know what? The sky's the limit. Let's double it. $200 million. Who cares? Screw the art. Screw the people. And so this obviously caused a lot of drama, and it resulted in an audit of this pension system and all the investments that they had been doing over the past several years. And they uncovered all the shady investments into risky assets and how they had been adjusting their accounting books to make it look like they were in less trouble than they actually were. And it's why this was such a surprise when the mayor came out and said, oh my God, we're going to go bankrupt. Yeah, I mean, I guess in that case, the uh, the burning of this art was almost a positive thing, that the city was able to learn that this pension was unstable, that it wasn't well-funded, and they could react to do something about it. And react they did. So last year in 2017, they passed a whole bunch of stuff in order to temporarily prop up this failing fund. They pulled funding from other programs, they increased mandatory contributions, the city's on the hook for a large portion of this. They increased uh, retirement age, but ultimately, all this stuff is just a stopgap solution, and they're still dependent on these very high returns, and they're planning on coming back in a couple of years to check in and see how this is going. But unless the market grows at rates that even now in one of the fastest growing markets in history aren't enough, unless this keeps happening indefinitely, this fund is still in deep trouble. But Daniel... Maybe we should talk about how these pensions get in these bad situations in the first place. I agree, David. But it does occur to me as we're talking about this that we haven't really even gone over in simple terms what a pension is in the first place. That's an excellent point, and I can't believe it slipped my mind. So wait, tell me if this is right. So this is my very fundamental understanding of what a pension is. I work for Daniel Forkner Industries, okay? 
Damn right. And I came up, you hired me, and we agreed on my salary, whatever that is, my benefits, and also a pension. Okay. And the deal of the pension was you will take, I don't know, $5,000 out of my salary, $20,000 out of my salary, whatever it is, every year, and you will invest that money for me in your pension fund. And then when I retire, when I hit this magic pension age, whatever that is, for the Dallas case, it was 50. Now it's 58. In a lot of pensions, it's 65. When I hit this magic age, you start paying me every month funds from your pension fund. Is that right? That's right. And those checks that you're going to be getting when you retire, they've already been defined. So a pension is a defined benefit plan because those checks that you're going to get have already been agreed to when you started working for me in this example. And it's contrasted with a defined contribution plan. So if you have a 401k, that's a defined contribution because you know how much you're putting into this 401k retirement plan. And then when you retire, you get this lump sum, whatever happens to be in the 401k. So pension is a little bit different in that you're right. You're going to get a set amount. And it's usually a percentage of the salary you had when you worked. So it's like being paid to be retired. Yeah. Well, that's an easy way to think about it. But you might be asking, well, how does a company pay for it? If a company knows, hey, in 30 years, I'm going to have to start paying my workers X amount of dollars. They're going to try and figure out, well, how much should I set aside right now? And the way they do that is they estimate how much return they can make on investments. Say it's 10% or 8%. You say, okay, well, if we're going to pay our employees this much when they retire 30 years from now, and if we expect the market to make X percent, so this is how much we can grow our money and investments then we can use a basic formula to figure out how much our employees should contribute. And it's that expected market return that has gotten these pensions into so much trouble. Now, to be fair, when the idea of pensions grew in popularity in the 1950s and the 1960s, you could get a very high what's called risk-free return. Now, risk-free return is something that you can count on. So this is interest on bonds and on treasury notes, things that you know you're going to be paid. And it's not like gambling in the stock market. It's a defined, absolute amount of money that's coming in. And at the time, these were very high, which makes it very easy for a pension to invest in this, have reasonable contributions from their employees, and to make a very safe return that's easy to plan around. But the days of those very high interest rates are long gone and probably never coming back. These fund managers, because they continue to assume high rates of return in their funding, in their investments, as the only way they can pay these benefits in the future, they have to increasingly look to riskier investments to make up the difference in this risk-free rate and the return they need to get. So less money is going towards safe bonds and more money is going towards these alternative risky investments like these real estate deals that Dallas was making. And like we said, this is not just a problem in Dallas. This is a worldwide systemic problem. You know, 12 years ago, the average portion of pension dollars that went to these risky investments like real estate has tripled, going from 7% of the pension's total assets to 22% today. 22% in risky real estate investments? That's right. That's a, a bold market play. And it seems to me something like that especially made right before, say, the financial crash in 2008, would have been a very bad decision and get a lot of pensions into trouble. The worst of these public pensions, in terms of budget shortfalls, is the California Public Employees Retirement System. CalPERS. CalPERS, exactly. Wait, wait a second, Daniel. I've actually looked at and read the uh, public financial statements of CalPERS because I have friends out there who are public school teachers and other things. And I told them about this pension stuff. I told them to watch out. And they said to me, oh, no, we don't have to worry. CalPERS is in a good system. They're well-funded. And I wasn't so sure about that. So when actually I pulled up their financial document from last year, I looked at their books, and their unfunded liabilities, they claim was only $150 billion. I say only there with very large air quotes. So that $150 billion that they're saying is a shortfall, that's how much they would need, according to them, today in order to fully fund all their benefits, right? But that $150 billion, this unfunded liability, is calculated by them using a return rate that they expect to make in the market. And the return rate that they use right now is about (laughs) 7.5%. Yeah, that's where this big thing says, okay, wait a second. You're estimating that you're going to get 7.5%. And now we should note here that this is not the standard way of calculating unfunded liabilities and pensions. This is something that has sort of come into vogue in these public pensions that are vastly underfunded. Private pensions tend not to calculate things the same way. Yeah, the public pensions, for some reason, they just look at their past returns and they're allowed to use 
a return that kind of conforms to their previous results. But as we know, uh, markets are not so predictable, right? And this also assumes compounded growth uninterrupted indefinitely. And so if you were to apply a more reasonable rate of return to their system, a risk-free rate, the same calculation that these private pensions tend to use, their unfunded liabilities are closer to $1 trillion, so eight times the amount that they have on their book. Now that is a lot of money. That's, that's a problem waiting to happen. It's the definition of a ticking time bomb. Yeah. And you know what's interesting about this is that actually a lot of groups, municipalities in California, have looked at these numbers, have said, wait, your unfunded liabilities, $150 billion with 7.5% or whatever growth. That seems totally unreasonable to us. We want to exit this pension program, okay? Makes sense. And Calper says, yeah, you can do whatever you want. If you want to get out of here and get off this sinking ship, feel free to do so. But if you do, you need to calculate your unfunded liabilities based on this risk-free calculation scheme. And of course, when a municipality does that and realizes, wait, if we do that, then we're super unfunded. We can't possibly get enough contributions from our teachers, from our police officers, whatever, to stay solvent in this risk-free way of calculating this. So you know what? We're just going to stay with CalPERS. And what's interesting about that is it's a mission from this pension program that, yes, we know we're doing things wrong. Yes, we know these returns are unrealistic. But if you jump out, which is something that would threaten the pension as a whole, you know, then you're on your own and we'll make sure that you're going to die too. So it's sort of, we're all going down together and we know that we're going down, but hopefully we can keep kicking this can down the road and then maybe the markets will go up forever and never go down, which uh, is uh, one way to look at it, I suppose. The difference between what these states say is their unfunded liabilities and what they actually are when we use a more realistic risk-free rate is the difference between about $2 trillion of current unfunded liabilities officially from these states. In reality, it's closer to $6 trillion. And that's immediate unfunded liabilities. That's how much we need today to make sure that those who have been promised a pension in the future by our public systems will be able to actually see it. Yeah, and what's really interesting to me is when you look at how big these discrepancies are in terms of percentage basis. So let's look at like a state that claims to have a really great funding ratio using their numbers. So like Florida is, is a great example for this. They claim to be 85% funded and only 15% in these unfunded liabilities using you know this home-brewed state calculation format. When in reality, using their risk-free calculation, they're less than 40% funded. That's a massive gap. And what's really funny is some states like Wisconsin, which in their defense, they are the most funded. They have the best pension program of any state, but they claim 100% funding. And, and that's a number they hit because they're using this twisted way of calculating it, and they targeted it because of this. So now they have 100% funding based on the idea of that they're going to get this guaranteed return when it's not true. When you look at the actual risk-free return, which is the only thing you can count on, especially if the market makes a downturn, then they're at 62% funding, which again is by far the best in the system. But you have to say, well, what kind of messed up system is this where the very best by a dramatic amount by 20% is only 60% funded. And just a quick shout out to Kentucky, who has abysmal funding in both their regular reporting, 44%, and their risk-free reporting, just 21% funding. Y'all got to get it together. And again, we talk about these as a lot of numbers, but really what this is, is the ability of people to retire and to survive as they retire, to continue living a comfortable life, to not become a burden on their children, on their family, and to society as a whole. I think that's important to focus on, David. Uh, ultimately, I mean, these unfunded liabilities, these are big numbers. But at the end of the day, this unfunded liability means that people have nothing to fall back on when they retire, if they even get to retire at this point, right? People like Jackie Harrison, she's a 62-year-old woman. And when she retired, she thought that she would be set up with this pension system that she was promised for all the years that she worked. But that pension system failed her. And ultimately, she had to sell her family home. And she had to move to a different city where living standards were cheaper. And she left behind a daughter, a grandchild, and her aging 80-year-old parents. She had to leave that behind because she couldn't afford it. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at people who cannot afford to live the lives that they were promised. And like you mentioned earlier, David, because a lot of these people won't be able to afford just their basic necessities, their rent, their healthcare costs, it means a higher burden as well for younger generations who, instead of saving for their retirement, because they're not going to get a pension, right? The pension system it won't exist for young people working today. Yeah. And who knows even about the social security system? I know I'm never counting on getting a check from that. 
So their only other option to prepare for retirement is to save their own money and, and hopefully make some investments. But they won't even be able to do that when they're spending all their money on maintaining their parents' lives, right? Yeah, and that's really the human element of this. Again, it's very easy to get trapped in all these numbers, these percentage points, these phrases like unfunded liabilities. But what this all really means is that these people paid their own money into a program that promised them money when they retired that said, we will take care of you because you are helping us now. And then because of mismanagement, because of lies, because of the way that these systems were constructed to fail, now these people's lives are broken. And even in this moment, we have to give a shout out to the Wall Street investment firms. Shout out. That, that no doubt see this reality, but are taking great advantage to make it so much worse. Well, they see this reality as a way to make some money. The need for so many of these pension systems to close the gap in their budget shortfalls have thrown them into these extremely shady relationships with investment firms in Wall Street and ultimately has hurt the beneficiaries of these pensions in just about every way. While these undeserving investment firms, um, market parasites really, rake in huge profits at the expense of the American public. Yeah, can we discuss one of my favorites? So I actually have some friends who work here. I, I say friends. I know some people who work here. Um, I know people who work in the financial industry who would like to work here because they're one of the big dogs on Wall Street. And that is the infamous, the evil Blackstone. Thank you for that introduction, David. Blackstone is one of these firms. It's not the largest investment firm in the world, but it may be the largest in the world for some of these high risk alternative investments. And many pension funds have agreed to these really terrible contracts with this firm. Among many things, they agree to these really exorbitant fees that eat into the investment returns of these pensions. One of the funds that was created by Blackstone, this Blackstone Alternative Asset Management Fund, it charges these pensions a percentage fee on the amount they manage, then charges 10% on any overall profits that the funds generate, an additional management fee, and then it invests this money into a conglomerate of hedge funds, which, by the way, have been proven again and again to underperform the market. And then on top of all that, Blackstone will charge additional fees for the benefit of these underlying hedge funds. And so these pension funds end up suffering worse returns because of these fees and general underperformance than they would investing in a simple index fund that just tracks the market. And because of the nature of these contracts, investment firms are allowed to keep raking in these fees regardless of how well they do with their investments. So they can even lose money. And these pension funds are still paying out fees to these fund managers who are actively losing money on the pensions. But this is sort of a devil's choice these pensions have had to make, right? Because yes, while they could take out an index fund and and while maybe that index fund would have absolutely been the right choice over the past five years in this unprecedented market growth, the fact of the matter is that's still not enough. They need these ultra high risk options to even have a chance of being able to meet these ridiculous returns that they need in order to survive. And while maybe one or two pension funds might in the short term win out on just the chance that some of these risky investments will play out, ultimately it means that on average, most of these pension funds are going to lose out. And likely it will be when the next recession hits. Well, you know, we have an interesting opportunity to look at what might happen when these pensions, when their reckoning day eventually comes. And that's with private pensions, because again, we talked about them. A lot of them were more conservatively managed, but private companies go out of business in ways that cities and states can't. And so when some of these businesses disappear, the pension funds do as well. So one of these great examples is McDonnell Douglas. Okay, this was a major airplane manufacturer, like as big as Boeing, as big as Lockheed Martin. This is a company that you would have pointed to and said, this company is going to be around for forever. And that's what the employees who work there thought. These are people who worked 20, 30 years at this company and thought that when they retired, their pensions will be set for forever. But in 1997, McDonnell Douglas merged with Boeing. And in doing so, most of their former obligations were dissolved, including these pensions. These people who had given their whole life to a company, who had been promised that the company would take care of them because they had taken care of the company throughout their whole life, well, that promise was broken. And now we have people like Tom Coomer, where he retired 65, and then when he realized Social Security wasn't going to be enough after all this pension disappeared, went back to work. And so now he's 79 years old, working full-time at Walmart as a greeter. Can't stand anymore. He sits on a stool and says hello to people as they walk in. For eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, working for a second part of his life, full-time job. As someone who was promised, if you give us your life, we will take care of you when you can no longer work. 
Well, that promise was broken and he's working again. And we see this story over and over and over with these pensions. But this isn't just limited to companies that are in trouble. UPS, United Parcel Service, the ubiquitous shipping company that we all know, they're a healthy company doing extremely well. But even they are unable to meet their pension obligations. UPS, along with Lockheed Martin, DuPont, will be freezing their pensions for 70,000 workers in order to reduce costs. And what's interesting is that while UPS is freezing its pension for this many workers, at the same time, they're spending over a billion dollars on improvements, which will increase their automation capabilities, which is kind of ironic, right? They're spending money on capital improvements that will reduce their need for labor. So even reducing that support ratio even more and further undermine their ability to pay these workers pensions obligations in the future. And what's funny is during this time, this company is saying, we can't afford this. We can't afford these obligations. We can't pay you. So we're freezing this. Well, you know what? Their stock has been going up. They've been doing well. Their revenue is up. They're making more and more money off of this. And so what they're doing by freezing this is stealing money from their employees. They're stealing money from the rest of us who are going to have to support their employees when they retire. They're stealing money from their employees' children who are going to have to support their parents when they retire because that funding, that promise is broken. They're not going to have the money to survive without help from family, without help from society, without help from all the rest of us, because these companies said, I will help you until it's too inconvenient for me. And then you know what? You're back on your own. All those promises I made, it's just my word. There was no obligation. But what happens when there is an obligation? As many of these cities and municipalities and these states have, they don't have the option to just go out of business and let their pension shrivel up and die. They don't have the option to just freeze their pensions and just say, hey, forget about it. Don't worry about it. They have an obligation. They have a legal responsibility to pay these pensions. But ultimately, a lot of these cities, a lot of these states are going to have to do some kind of bankruptcy because these are unsustainable. There's just no money to pay them. And what that means is, you know, relating it back to our infrastructure episode is I think we're going to see a death spiral in many municipalities in this country when the recession hits and these unfunded liabilities really blow up. Cities are going to have to make really uncomfortable choices. Part of it will be like Dallas did in order to pay their pension obligations, raising taxes, raising the contributions that city employees have to make, lowering the benefits that they'll ultimately pay out to these people, maybe raising more debt in order to pay these. And remember that the whole purpose of this pension system in the first place, one of the main reasons was to attract workers to cities, to provide good city services, to attract more residents, increase your tax base, and keep growing. Well, when they can no longer guarantee to their public workers that they can uphold these promises they've made, people won't want to work for these cities, which means that their civil services will decline. Less people pay into the pensions, too. And when that happens, less people will want to live in these cities especially when they have to start raising taxes, right? This is a positive feedback loop that's going to happen, driving these cities into bankruptcy and destitution. Dan, that's dark from you. I'm normally the dark one. But that's how big of a problem this is. This is inescapable. It's coming. And uh, it's going to have gigantic effects on our municipalities, on people trying to retire, and in the markets as a whole, because these pension funds are going to panic trying to find these risky investments. And when those eventually blow up, that's a huge amount of money that disappeared. Again, the 2008 crisis that caused all that blow up was over just about $2 trillion worth of money. And this unfunded liabilities problem that we're facing right now on just these public pensions is over $6 trillion. Which is a third of the United States total gross domestic product. It's a lot of money. And those private pensions that we mentioned were more conservative with their estimates. Well, they're struggling too. Over 40% are frozen or destroyed or canceled at this point in Fortune 500 companies. And again, remember, all of this, this big problem that we're facing right now is under one of the largest stock market growth in the history of the market. And if they can't find this money now, then I don't, I don't know what to tell them because it's not going to get better. The news keeps going on about how invincible the economy is, but the warning bells are sounding. The IMF, the World Bank, lots of analysts, lots of banks are saying, this is all about to blow up on us. We need to start looking out for this recession that's coming. Well, when that happens, you're going to see these unfunded liabilities explode, and this hole will never, ever be able to get out of. And as people retire and they suddenly find that the money they expected isn't there, well, who knows what's going to happen. What do we do, David? You know, a lot of times we sit here and we're like, well, if we just look at it this way, then maybe things will be able to be fine. But with this pension problem, I'm really, I don't see a way out of it. I'm completely honest. Bankruptcy is not an option because of all the other negative effects it's going to have. 
And so it, we're just going to have to deal with this fallout as it comes. And I mean, the conventional wisdom here is to say, well, you, you should be saving for your own retirement outside of these programs. You are personally responsible for being able to live out your life after you retire. And ultimately, that's where the blame is going to be placed. When the fallout comes, right? It says, well, these people didn't prepare better. They're just trying to be rich pensioners living off our money now, right? Which is kind of how the narrative has shifted, right? Starting in the 90s. And these, so these bankers will probably get away. And again, it's going to fall on, hey, well, you can't afford retirement. How come you didn't save when you were working? But doesn't that seem wrong to you? The idea that because we're living longer, better lives, and I say better under quotation marks with some of these things we're talking about now, but because we're living for a longer time, we're also working for longer than we ever have in human history. And when has it become that the human experience is about working our whole lives just so we can survive? Working at 79, standing in Walmart, saying hello to people, handing them shopping bags so they can buy more stuff. And that's how we spend our sunset years. That seems messed up. And so it's the responsibility of society to take care of all of us, I think. And not an individual narrative saying you are responsible for yourself. And while that might be practical, I don't think that's a system we should be looking at. We should be in a world where we watch out for each other. And again, this is something we've talked about even in the last episode, in a world where we can trust each other. I think also a world where we can count on helping each other when we need it, in times like this, when we can no longer work, when we deserve to have some time off, to relax after a lifetime of contribution to these companies, to these states, to these governments, and to each other. I think you're onto something, David. And one of the sad things about this narrative that, hey, it's your responsibility to take care of your retirement. And the fact that so many of these pension systems are extending the retirement age is when you're forced to work into your old age, ultimately, this is kind of like a discrimination because if you live in a poor area and you don't, didn't have the best health care growing up, you're probably not going to live as long. So you're going to be paying into these pension systems into your 70s or even your 80s in some cases. And then you're not going to make it to your retirement age. But the fact that you've been paying into this pension system, trying to follow the narrative of working hard and earning your retirement, you're ultimately going to just be paying the benefits to those who live in richer areas, who had better health care and can live a lot longer life. And not just that, but also poor people who did not have the opportunity to get a good education and develop these specialized intellectual skills, who the only work for them that's possible is these Walmart greeter roles or swinging a hammer, things that are difficult to do when you're in old age and maybe suffer from different physical discomforts. You also won't be able to sustain that lifestyle. Well, those in richer areas who did have those opportunities to develop those specialized skills can work away in their architecture firms or engineering firms and work in relative comfort. I think you've really hit on a great point is, is how much this disproportionately affects those less well off and not just in their lives, but in terms of their children as well. If somebody has to spend whatever meager savings they were able to scrape together on surviving without their pension then that's wealth they can't pass on to their children. That's a loss of generational wealth. And people who do well, who don't have to depend on that, can pass this on and enhance that inequality even further. More than that, a lot of savings programs, how the government decides, are the elderly able to survive in retirement? And the numbers that they say is, it varies a lot. Remember, this is a country where less than 50% of people can come up with $1,000 for an emergency, okay? And what the government says, what these think tanks say when they analyze this, is that maybe a third to two-thirds of Americans are not prepared at all for retirement. And when you look at what they say prepared for retirement, what that means, a lot of that funding of being able to survive in their retirement, yes, it's pensions, yes, it's Social Security, but also includes things like reverse mortgages on their home. Again, that's taking away wealth that will be passed on to a younger generation and passing it instead to the financial instruments around us, to banks. This is another thing that enhances this inequality. And the very idea of retirement, of the way that we have to pay for it ourselves and survive this way, is about heightening that inequality. If you have parents who may be facing the consequences of this pension crisis, and you know firsthand the fact that you may be responsible financially for their well-being into their retirement, which is going to hurt your ability to save. And if you don't, but you recognize that people around you might be in that situation, you should demand, we should all demand a society that doesn't place the failings of these systems on individuals, but it's a society that rather recognizes that we all need to take care of each other and that we're all in this together. And it's not okay for people to end their lives in poverty or live their lives in poverty at all, honestly. 
But that's just something we'll have to think about. You know, here on Ashes Ashes, on this podcast, we might be accused a lot of talking about this negative news, about the bad things happening in the world. And yes, well, that's true. But we do so because we want to see a better world, because we think a better world is possible. And that's ultimately the end conversation of all of these. Is once we know these issues, then we can be aware of what's going wrong, and we can work together to work towards a world where these things can't happen. And when we see a recession and these consequences start to take place, we shouldn't point fingers and blame each other and blame these pension managers, even though they, they have played a role in this. The time for pointing fingers will be over, and the time for extending our hand to our neighbors and our family members and trying to build communities that support each other will be the only thing worth doing. We should consider that now before we're facing the worst part of all this so that we can be prepared. That wraps it up for this week. If you want to learn more about this, about the impending pension crisis, or read a full transcript of this episode, all that is available and more on our website, ashesashes.org. You can also find us on your favorite social media network at Ashes Ashes Cast. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible. We will never use ads to support this podcast, so if you enjoy it and would like us to keep going, you can support us by giving us a review and recommending us to a friend. We hope you tune in next week. This is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.